Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce someone who can appropriately introduce today's speaker, and that is Professor Sally Benson out here in the front. Sally is a professor in the Department of Energy Science and Engineering. Uh, she also was, up until a year ago, there's an energy seminar on this too, uh, the key person in the Biden White House in charge of uh, the strategy for energy transition. So she has that in her uh, list of many, many credits. Before that, she was the director and deputy director of the Precourt Institute. And importantly, and significantly there, she actually ran as the faculty director of the energy seminar for five or six years. And as I always say, mumbling, wandering around late at night, she was then and still is a hard act to follow. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sally Benson to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, John. Uh, actually, I, I was famous then when I ran the energy seminar. We, uh, and we still do, but we opened it up to the community and that was before we had Zoom and we could do things remotely. So we had a whole group of people from the surrounding community who would come every time and they were very good fans. And uh, I remember walking through places like Stanford Shopping Center or Town and Country, and people would walk up and say, oh my God, you're the energy seminar lady. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> anyway, uh, so, on, so far. <laughs> on with the important topic. Uh, so today we're going to hear from uh, Karan Buwalka, who is a staff research engineer at the Stanford Precourt Institute for Energy, uh, right in the building next door. And his research focuses on how to build sustainable and resilient supply chains for materials needed in Okay, that's a mouthful, but uh, in short, you know, historically when we think about energy and we think about energy security, we, we would think about, oh, well, do we have enough oil, gas, coal, whatever, those were the materials that were the foundation of the energy system. You know, as we transition to a new energy system, uh, we're unlikely to need as much oil, gas, and coal, maybe none whatsoever. But we are going to need a whole set of other critical materials uh, in order to build all of the devices. And Karan is one of a, sort of a, a new generation of scholars who has begun to tackle this question using uh, a lot of innovative methods from sort of systems engineering and so forth. So uh, anyway, I'm really delighted uh, that he's going to talk with you about that. So just a little bit more that uh, he's part of something called the STEER program up, that, up on the top there. And this is a collaboration amongst uh, a number and growing number of faculty and students and, and staff across the campus who are trying to understand what are the most important things for us to invest in? What are the most important things for us to build? And where do we need to innovate? So in that capacity, um, he leads the materials supply chain modeling work for STEER, which is a collaboration, again, between not only the Precord Institute, but Slack National Laboratory. So thanks very much for that wonderful collaboration. And uh, yeah, so he's going to be talking about uh, some of the work he's done as part of his PhD uh, research at MIT, but also bringing that into the into the into the current state of his research. Uh, his uh, he got a, a dual master's degree in technology policy and computer science at N um, MIT, and this did his PhD in mechanical engineering. If you are curious after the end of his talk, like how do you get to know this kind of stuff? Well, that's where it came from. And his undergraduate education was in met, uh, metallurgy and material science at IIT Bombay. Uh, so just uh, a little bit more. So, so Karan is also or organizing something called the Sustainable Systems Seminar. Does anybody here go to the Sustainable System Seminar? Yay, okay. Anyway, that's a fantastic group. It's a you know, sort of grassroots um, uh, collaboration and coordinate, coordination uh, across the uh, students and postdocs and so forth who have an interest in systems modeling. So if, if that interests you, you know, go find him after this seminar and, uh, and you'll all be welcome to join that. <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, outside Stanford, he also co-leads something called the Interdisciplinary Critical Minerals Lab, along with faculty from Carnegie Mellon and the Colorado Schools of Mind. So uh, so he has uh, done a, a lot of his own research, but he's also a wonderful member of the community bringing people together to solve these challenging problems. So with that, please join me in welcoming Tamara. Thank you, Sally, for that wonderful introduction. I, uh, it's been a pleasure to join the Stanford community over the last five, six months to work with people like Sally, like Adrian, Julia, Julia uh, at, as part of the STEER program. And really, uh, you know, there's this wealth of energy research and you know, energy on campus, pun intended, which it's been great to be a part of, right? And I'm going to focus on maybe a part of the energy system that has not been paid as much attention to historically, but over time people are paying more and more attention to kind of the material supply chains that underlie these energy systems and how to scale those up as we transition actively from fossil fuel resources to, uh, to kind of clean energy technologies that rely on these materials. So kind of the thing that keeps me up at night and keeps sort of the steer group up at night is the idea that we need to scale up these energy technologies really fast. So even if you look at the most, like the technology that we consider to have scaled up really fast, like televisions and mobile phones, they take to the order of decades to go from sort of early stage commercialization to kind of full adoption, right? And we need to now do that for a range of energy technologies like EVs, uh, energy storage, hydrogen. And to do that, we need research to kind of work with industry and policy to catalyze technology learning, so reduce costs of new technologies, to build supply chains for these technologies, and to identify commercialization pathways. And the critical thing is you need all of that to happen at the same time. So that's where we need sort of this systems analysis framework that looks at the supply chain for these technologies, looks at the various energy technology options, and conducts technology road mapping, and looks at how market adoption might uh, might take place for these technologies going ahead of time. So that's kind of the genesis, genesis of the STEER group, which was uh, kind of the brainchild of Will Chu in material science, Sally Benson, and Adrian Yao out here in the front. And uh, it's a collaboration, as Sally mentioned, between Stanford Energy and the Slack National Lab and gets support from the Department of Energy, is to really do this integrated modeling that looks at the supply chain for these materials, understands the effects of the supply chain on technology costs and deployment, and then understands how as technology costs evolve, how they make their way into the energy system and provide services that we need to kind of decarbonize the world, right? I'm gonna be focusing on the sort of the material supply chain part of the work at STEER. I'll highlight some of the other work we're doing, but focus specifically on how you can use supply chain analysis to help make decisions that accelerate the energy transition. So the first thing I want to kind of set up, and maybe a lot of you know this, maybe you don't, is that the energy transition is materials intensive. So as you start using uh, things like EVs and batteries and hydrogen-based technologies, you use less for fossil fuels, you use less carbon, but you use a huge range of other materials. So this is kind of my foray into research with this project I did with Ford Motor Company, where you got a very detailed data set on all the material that goes into the car. So it had the ink and paper of the instruction manual, for example, in this data set. And what we found is basically you use the entire periodic table in these cars, right? And each of those, each of the, the parts in the cars are reliant on very complex supply chains. But more critically, as you electrify these cars, you are reliant on a specific set of materials that have very large supply chain vulnerabilities. So I've kind of highlighted some of them here, lithium, cobalt, nickel, and some rare earth elements at the bottom, and these supply chains are very stretched. So what we found is as you electrify, the, like in this case, vehicle technologies, you get your vulnerability to supply disruption increases significantly. So trying to figure out how you can build those supply chains is a pretty critical part of that transition. So as a consequence of that, we expect as you meet net zero targets, a lot of these materials to have a strong increase in demand. So if you look at Cobalt, nickel, lithium, and copper, four materials that sort of underlie a large set of technologies we use for clean energy, 
you see you know from 50% to 900% growth in the demand of the for these materials going up to 2050 right that's a significant amount of materials extraction and processing that we have to build to meet that demand at the same time while we're building up these supply chains you want to ensure that those are stable and prices of those materials don't increase too much because if the price of those materials go up those technologies get expensive and it slows down deployment so you want to balance increasing supply while keeping prices relatively stable. And more importantly, ensuring that you do that while minimizing sort of social and environmental impacts. So kind of this figure on the right, uh, my right, your left, is a piece of art. It basically superimposes an orb of how much copper is mined from digging that much land. So basically for each ton of ore, you typically have 0.5%, 0.05%, so 0 0.005 of uh, that ore is copper, right? So you have to dig a lot of land, for example, to get a small, relatively small amount of copper out of it. And a lot of these mining resources and these mineral resources are located in areas which have high water risk, they're close to indigenous communities. So it can get, it can be very difficult to, you can't just go in and mine the earth out, right? Because you have these consequences of doing that. If you could just go and extract all the resources from the earth, store it in the warehouse, you wouldn't have a supply chain issue, but we don't want to do that because mining these materials has significant consequences. So you want to minimize that. And this kind of interacts in a very complex and interesting way with the political system. So the largest copper deposit in the US is in Arizona. It would meet 25% of copper demand across the US, that's huge, because you need copper in all your wiring and electrical grids, et cetera. It is on top of a religious, it is below a religious site for the Apache tribe, right? So in 2014, I believe the Obama administration agreed for a land swap where they would, where Rio Tinto would give land to the Apache tribe in exchange for this religious land where the mineral deposit is located. Biden, so then the Trump administration was okay with that. Biden came to power, froze the land swap that Obama had put in, put in place. Um, and then it went to the San Francisco court. They approved the land swap. Right now it's going to the Supreme Court. The thing I want to highlight, highlight here is Arizona is a swing state in the election. And so is Nevada, where a lot of lithium mines are based, right? So the kind of local community buy-in and politics comes in very interestingly in terms of thinking about where to build the supply chain. You can't just build it wherever, you have to really think about where you want to place these projects, right? And that becomes critically important. So the question that my work and modeling focuses on is how do you balance these competing considerations? So you have these local impacts from extraction, you have this need for energy security, but you want low-cost materials. How can we use modeling and analysis to find a path that minimizes those impacts while making those materials available? And what I will sort of present here is this integrated modeling approach that guides where to build supply chain capacity. So we want, by integrated, I mean something that accounts for how the energy system is changing and connects those supply chains to the energy system. And by what to build, it's kind of talking about where should we prioritize investments in terms of projects and technologies to have the maximum chance of scaling up these supply chains in a sustainable way. So, Kind of to highlight the idea here, you have a lot of people across campus, across the US, doing really good energy systems modeling. So what that does is tells you as a function of, or like you want to meet some decarbonization goal, and it, it optimizes for low, lowering cost and lowering carbon dioxide emissions, and tells you how many EVs would be, need to be a part of that fleet to meet that goal. How much solar or wind would you need? And kind of where I fit in is sort of looking at the implication of that upstream in the supply chain. So as you deploy more EVs, you need more batteries. So LFP is lithium ion phosphate, which is a kind of battery. NMC is nickel manganese cobalt. It's another kind of battery and the sodium ion. All of those rely on separate sets of materials and have uh, their own set of environmental impacts, right? So I kind of look at the system as, as you deploy energy technologies, what's the impact upstream? It's kind of flipped, but you get the point. But also, as you have sort of supply risks and disruptions from the supply chain, how does that impact energy system model results and deployment? So how can we kind of integrate and look at that whole thing as a full system rather than 
treating those things in isolation. So the way it works is there, it, there's an economic model and that understands how supply availability for materials impacts energy technology deployment. So typically what an energy systems model would tell you is what is the demand for copper uh, going uh, from 2020 to 2040 in some net zero scenario, right? It'll tell you we need to build these many, uh, these many gigawatt hours of transmission capacity, et cetera, and that means we need this much copper. So you have some demand projections that come out of these models, and then you know something about current available supply. So typically the way people do this, is they just say that there's gonna be a gap between demand and supply open up in the future for materials. But we know in reality, the kind of equilibrium will lie somewhere in between, where some of that energy technology demand will get destroyed because the supply wasn't available and people will find substitutes. And in some cases, you'll be able to scale up production to meet demand. So the, question, the way I frame the question is, where does that black line lie, right? Is the supply a constraint that makes sure that slows down the energy transition and makes that black line closer to the purple line? Or are you able to scale up supply chains fast enough for that black line to be close to the ideal net zero scenario? Right? So that's kind of the framing of the modeling. The way we do that is you take this demand input scenario from various energy systems models. So you have some demand for materials. They have a price elasticity. So that basically says, as prices for materials go up, how does that demand change? And there's some recycling rates. So as you increase the recycling, you need less new mining, right? So all of that kind of adds up to the model need, so model says that you need to open some amount of mining capacity in every period. And basically we take data on geologic resources and estimate where mines might open based on stuff we know about how good the geologic resources are to meet that demand. So kind of the supply and demand balance uh, based on some imbalances in supply and demand, there's price formation. That price feeds back into demand and also feeds back into sort of the supply decisions of where you build projects. The kind of, I'm gonna spend maybe five more minutes talking about how this is done and then give you a case study of how you can use this. But the idea is that uh, what you really need is long-term supply curves for these materials, right? We know where mining production is happening right now, but we don't really know where mining production will happen 10 years from now. So we need an estimate of mineral supply availability and costs over long-term long -term time horizons. And so a lot of the modeling work that goes in is to estimate that. How do you do that? We have the US Geological Survey, for example, and various, a lot of mineral exploration. They do a lot of work to characterize mineral deposits. So you know something about how much resource there is in the ground and what the quality of that resource is. So how good the ore grade is, which basically says for each amount of rock, how much copper there is or how much lithium there is in that ore body. And we know something about the cost of currently operating projects. So this is a cost curve that each bar is a mining project. The width of the bar is how much material they produce. The height of the bar is their cost. And you basically, it's what this says is, if prices are, let's say, below $6 per pound on that plot, a very small proportion of these projects will actually operate. If prices are higher, a larger proportion of these projects will operate. So that's like a supply curve for mining. And the idea is to kind of use the cost data and the geologic data to estimate long-term supply curves. So you have some data on a lot of projects with the resources and grades and, uh, some, and some missing data. You kind of, we use a nearest neighbors algorithm, which basically says for data, I don't know the quality of the resource. I assume it's similar to the uh, mines next to it, right? And then using some regression models, you can estimate the cost for all the deposits that we have found so far. So what you come up with is you have that supply curve on the left for nickel, which is currently operating projects, but you can come up with this estimate for every all the deposits that exist in the world, what's this long-term availability and the cost of mining those deposits. I will put an asterisk here, this is an estimate, right? There's a lot of assumptions that go in into modeling these costs and we do a bunch of sensitivity analysis on how those costs change. So the idea is as demand progresses over time, so the black line here is the demand curve, the green curve is the supply curve. As demand progresses over time, a lot of those projects, the lowest cost projects, make opening decisions and enter the supply curve. And based on the equilibrium between demand and supply in every period, 
price evolves and then feeds back into the model. So you kind of have this economic equilibrium modeling approach that shows how supply evolves as a function of this growing demand for materials. The final piece of this puzzle is including environmental impacts into that supply curve, right? So given that you know what kind of deposit it is, you know something about the quality of that deposit, we have an estimate from life cycle assessments and other inventories of what might be the various environmental impacts if we were to mine that deposit, right? So in this case for nickel there, and I'll talk a lot about nickel in that case study, there are three types of processing pathways based on the kind of deposit that exists. They have a significant range in terms of their uh, environmental footprint. And what you can see is based on the modeling, how, how much of the kind of dirtier red projects open versus how much of the cleaner blue projects open. Right? So that's kind of the model endogenously predicts that. So we have all those pieces. How do we apply it to guide policy in the real world? Right? So I'm going to talk right now about using a model for nickel and how that kind of modeling can influence what kind of nickel capacity you build. Nickel is particularly interesting because it's a highly dynamic system. What's happening in the battery space is you see this substitution from nickel-based NMC batteries to LFP batteries that do not rely on nickel, right? So there's this huge uncertainty in terms of how much demand for nickel will be there in the future. And that is changing, that is leading producers to effectively try to mine nickel at the lowest cost possible. So they are making decisions to not mine potentially more expensive and environmentally friendly grades of nickel, but whatever the cheapest grade of nickel there is to remain cost competitive, right? So what's happened in the last 10 years is Indonesia, which has a large amount of low-grade nickel resources, has massively expanded production. So they've gone from around 10% of production to 50% in the span of a decade. And Indonesia basically realizes they want to make a battery industry. And their battery industry relies on them having nickel, right? So to the extent that nickel is under threat from substitution, it threatens their entire economic prospects. So they want to, they basically come out and said, we want to keep prices as low as possible. We are going to build as much supply as we can, and pretty much no matter what, right? The consequence of that is mining projects in nickel are shutting down across the world. So Australia's mining capacity for nickel has basically gone to zero. There's a bunch of nickel plants that were planning to open in the US and Canada that have stopped their plans. So price of nickel has gone down, and basically all of the mining capacity that's coming online is coming online in Indonesia. Now, the reason that matters from sort of a global point of view, it could be okay to have all your mining capacity come online from Indonesia, is that there are these three ways to make nickel, right? Um, and the kind of projects we're talking about in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and I mean sort of kind of uh, in Russia and in Canada, are this yellow sulfide smelting pathway. So those are sulfide deposits, so it's a nickel sulfur deposit, and it's a and kind of processing that to battery grade nickel is an exothermic process, so you need less energy. So the GHG intensity of the process is really low, but there's very few deposits that actually exist for that, which means that it takes a long time to prospect and build a plant. Meanwhile, the sort of Indonesian projects, which are the laterites, especially the laterite smelting one that they started growing a lot of, it it builds on existing capacity for nickel pig iron, which is used in stainless steel. So you can build that capacity really fast, but it has a huge environmental consequence. So what's happening is you're building these really high emissions projects which can come online really fast, and that is displacing mining projects with low impact in places like Australia and the US, right? So the question is, uh, how can we sort of optimize to make sure that we have a good mix of nickel supply to meet demand? Right? And the other thing I'll say is I showed carbon emissions on that plot. If this is kind of trend is true for a bunch of environmental metrics like acidification potential, land use, water use, particulate matter, et cetera. So I, we run this sort of economic model over the next 25 years. Um, and what you see is in the baseline, the black line is IEA's net zero demand scenario for nickel. Most of the mining and processing capacity that comes online is this high impact laterite smelting pathway because it can come online really fast, right? 
And the influence of that is that supply chain emissions for nickel skyrocket from 30 kilograms CO2 per kilogram of nickel to over 70. So what's happening is the dynamics of the way that supply chain is evolving is, lead, is leading you down a path where the nickel industry gets dirtier and dirtier over time, right? So the question is, can we do something about that? Can we meet that demand without sacrificing the supply chain impact? So what are the options we have? You could go in and say, I'm going to put a carbon tax on nickel. I am going to put a carbon tax on all the nickel coming out of Indonesia, and that will increase the cost of these high emissions projects. And that's true. What that does on the right, you can see that process emissions go down. But because you now a lot of those red projects are not profitable anymore, you have this gap opening up between demand and supply, right? And this constant, so the supply is these bars and the demand is the black line. All of that demand is not met. So prices for the material go up, right? So you have this trade-off between you add a carbon tax that reduces your supply chain emissions, but battery prices go up because nickel-based chemistry battery prices go up because nickel prices go up because there's a demand and supply mismatch. So we're kind of stuck right now between a rock and a hard place, which is you can get sort of dirty nickel and meet the demand, or you can have more expensive batteries and have clean nickel. And that's not somewhere we want to be, right? We'd ideally want cheap batteries and clean nickel. So what can we do? So we run this model in what I call a coordinated industry scenario, where you combine a carbon tax with some increased substitution to LFP. So you reduce some of that demand pressure to say, we don't need nickel demand to be that strong. Some of that goes away to LFP. And you have, and you have accelerated project development. So at the same time, we accelerate projects in North America and Australia and even in Indonesia, right? And when you do that, you kind of have a more demand supply balance, so the costs of material are low, and you have a low carbon footprint. The catch there is in reality, those two things don't exist at the same time. It's very hard to convince a project developer to open a project when demand is being substituted away from nickel to non-nickel, right? And that's where the role of things like industrial policy come in, which is if, if we want low-cost batteries for an energy transition, we need to support nickel mining projects that are currently facing significant price pressures, right? To kind of accelerate those projects at times where they are currently slowing down and do that while also promoting technology substitutions. So you want a large range of technology options but you want to make sure that the fact that their substitution is not preventing you from investing in the nickel supply chain. Because if you do that, you're sort of locking yourself out of nickel-based chemistries, right? If I don't build nickel supply and I don't invest in that as a government, it's, it's most likely that nickel-based chemistries are going to get more expensive and eventually no one's going to use them. So it's kind of a race to the bottom. So industrial policy kind of needs to come in and look at that whole system and figure out how you can make sure that you balance these two objectives by supporting these kinds of projects. So the kind of takeaway message here is that you need that sort of supply chain alignment. You need alignment between a kind of uh, uh, between regulations and standards that prevent the dirty projects from opening. You need technology options to reduce the pressure on any one supply chain, but you also need sort of surprise support for the low impact supply. And all those three things need to coexist for this supply chain to work. And if you don't have one of those pieces, you won't get that outcome. That sort of brings me kind of zooming back out to this idea that we are trying to build at steel, right? That you need to think of these interactions in a sort of inter in sort of this interlinked way. I've kind of presented this framework, which is generalizable. So I've shown it for nickel, but basically you can take any materials, geologic and cost data and build these sort of supply curves. You can take energy systems models and models of technology substitution to build the demand curves, and then look at these interactions to ask a set of questions. So you can think about how supply disruptions impact EV sales. You can think about recycling, right? I've done a bunch of work on building these sort of cost curves for recycling systems and comparing those cost curves with mining. And think about how, when can recycling displace mining in the long term. So you can kind of apply this framework to a large set of policy questions in this space. And that's where sort of this plugs in to the work we're doing at STEER. So like now I've shown you a part of the picture, but it's kind of 
much more complicated than that, right? So you might have some substitution from NMC to LFP, but we then need to think about the phosphoric acid supply chain. Um, and what are the impacts of that? Are we going from, basically we think that going from nickel to uh, LFP is good, but actually it's worse. This is a story that happened with cobalt, right? We had high cobalt-based, low nickel-based chemistries, and we were worried about sort of human rights impact in the cobalt supply chain. So everyone's like, okay, let's get rid of cobalt. Let's move to nickel. We moved to nickel, and now we're worried about nickel. We kind of want to stop this jumping around and be a bit more strategic about planning what sort of technologies we build and where they fit in. So that's where at Steer we're doing a bunch of work connecting the supply chain modeling to the downstream technology road mapping. So comparing various battery chemistries, lithium ion and sodium ion, and also doing a lot of market energy systems modeling to understand how the market might progress. So this is work by Adrian, who's in front. You should talk to him about it if it's interesting, which connects sort of materials prices and market demand forecasts to understand how various battery technology costs might progress over time as a function of those inputs. So what you could do is you can take a mineral supply disruption from the models I showed, the price of the materials go up, it will tell you how various technologies become more or less competitive based on that. Right? So the idea is to kind of link that supply chain analysis with this downstream technology cost modeling to have better understanding of how these link together. And then we have Yulia, who is kind of here in the back, doing energy systems modeling, which says as these technology costs go down, how much more do they get deployed? So we want to link a supply chain effect all the way to how deployment of technology. Currently, we're working on three projects that are sort of interlinked in this way. I'm focusing uh, on leading a project understanding a graphite supply chain. So nickel, phosphor, like LFP, NMC are all the cathodes of batteries. The anode is entirely graphite. 95% of that comes from China, right? And so we're trying to figure out as you sort of scale these supply chains, is it possible or how can you make it competitive and diversify those supply chains, right? So we're doing a lot of cost modeling on graphite. Um, Adrian's leading a bunch of work looking at uh, the costs of uh, energy storage in the real world. So if you deploy an energy storage system, what is the cost of that on the grid in different scenarios? And Yulia's kind of leading work that says that as these energy storage systems get safer and low, lower cost, how does that influence the deployment of those systems on the grid? So when do we sort of get these kind of S-curves of you reduce the cost enough that a lot of people deploy them? So kind of, again, trying to integrate from the supply chain all the way to energy systems. The last thing I'd say about STEER is that because of how dynamic these systems are, we, we try to make the modeling as up-to-date as possible by including industry feedback throughout the research process. So what we do is we, start, we started working on, let's say, this graphite project. We will kind of reach out to a bunch of companies, learn from them about graphite, do site visits, and hold what we call the round table. So this happened last month, where you got CEOs and CTOs from a large amount of companies into the same room to tell us what sort of modeling and analysis is the most useful. So kind of getting industry input early on in the research process. You kind of take all that input, do modeling and analysis, uh, write a preprint report, which we then send back out to, these, to the industry to get that feedback and tell them to tell us why we're wrong. Right, so the idea is we know this is the model, we know it has assumptions, tell us which assumptions are the weakest. And that's what happened with the sodium ion work that, from that Adrian led, that I showed you, where Adrian published the preprint, got a lot of industry feedback, and that helped revise the modeling, and now it's kind of being published and is going into policy briefings. So kind of the two main threads of this work is linking supply chains to systems, but then having a lot of industry feedback within that research process. Um, the last thing I'll say, I think the gray is not coming on this plot, is that this approach is not limited to batteries. I've spoken mostly about batteries today, but you can apply it to things like hydrogen, which rely on uh, you know, things like iridium as materials, and you can apply it to like thermal storage. This approach is pretty generalizable, and you need to be able to apply that across various technologies and uh, systems, right? And so the idea is to kind of promote this kind of work and collaborate with people who are experts in these various things because no one person will have the necessary expertise to be able to answer the set of questions from supply chains to kind of electricity systems 
So we need to be able to collaborate with people on campus, people outside campus to really do impactful work here. This is not kind of work that you can do as an individual PhD student. It has to be collaborated. So kind of my final thoughts is we need to scale up everything all at once. And because it's so challenging to kind of answer questions on where to invest, you need analysis to guide that policy making. Um, and research, I've kind of tried to demonstrate that research can help do that, but only if it has this industry engagement built in and tackling these complex systems needs the kind of collaboration I was just talking about a minute ago. Um, so if you're a student or a postdoc or anyone on the campus and you want to collaborate, as Sally said, sign up for this lunch seminar. It's student-led. It's students from across campus working on water systems, energy systems. The idea is to share methodology, share uh, kind of insights with each other and have those collaborations built in. So that's um, something to keep an eye out for. Thank you. I think any of us can call any questioners. We usually start with students, but we have mostly students here. Mm -hmm. I actually would, just as a uh, prelude to what I know some of the audience is probably interested in, what, see if you agree with this. Once you get this down to this level of disaggregation, and you did give examples, not just in passing, you could easily consider issues re involving environmental justice, particularly in certain minerals that are, are really, really bad in certain areas. And I know you're already working with people on that. The other thing, uh, we have a speaker next quarter we'll talk about his collaboration with you. You could also do international geopolitics. So it may be in the IRA-ish world that some policymakers say in the US are willing to pay a little bit more, just as you've shown the trade-offs here, mm -hmm. in order to not have all the mines in Indonesia. I saw in your slide, it seemed like a lot of them were controlled by China. And we don't know how much we just we want to collaborate with China, but it's just a great kind of feeds into your last couple of points here that this is kind of set up to do a lot more collaboration than we already have, which is already a lot of collaboration. <laughs> so with that, who has questions in those or other areas? Mm -hmm. Do you know uh, we'll map about the capacity? Yes. Okay. Of minerals, like how is that produced? Like, are you considering stream projects or like um, a project right on the exploration side? So, both um, Swiss map. So, that's a map of deposits. So, that's not, it's a geologic deposits. It's not necessarily operating projects. But basically, the data source for all of this is SP Global Market Intelligence. They have a database of all my metals and mining projects across stages of development. So including early stage exploration, uh, late stage exploration, currently under construction and operating. So the data set, so the basically market intelligence companies for investors track this kind of data. Because if I wanted to invest in a mining company, I would want to know what deposits they own, what assets they own. So there are market intelligence companies that have databases of all the assets that exist and then not just operating assets. They're also early stage. So that's kind of, and they're like latitude and longitude of that asset is there. So you can do a lot of sort of geopolitical. More interestingly, ownership of that asset is also there. So it tells you for that asset, which, which company owns that asset and which country that company is based in. So you can then analyze, you know, more like trade risk type things. Last thing I'll say on data is that it tends to be biased. They have more data for Western firms than they do for Asian firms. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think this is really cool, really important work. You talked about working with industry, and you also talked about using this to inform industrial policy. I'm really curious, how are y'all engaging with policymakers to help get these findings into the policymaking discussion? Yeah, um, a great question. So first thing to say there is our funding is entirely from the Department of Energy. So we have a lot, and we kind of have these sort of policy briefings where we bring not just Department of Energy, but aware like Department of Defense, et cetera, to present our findings and send them our reports. So that's a more direct way we engage with policy. Um, indirectly, publications and sort of kind of promoting that in the news tends to help. Um, I don't know, if, uh, Sally, if you wanted to say anything more about policy engagement. I mean, I think the other thing is we try to figure out what their biggest questions are and help answer them. Yeah, yeah. right, that's right. So kind of, so the reason we looked at graphite, for example, is we went to the manufacturing energy supply chains office in the DOE, and we asked them, what are you most worried about? And they said graphite. 
So like, okay, we look at graphite. So that's kind of another way you engage with policy. Um, just to interject, you could also do other stakeholders quite easily in just the same kind of format, environmental justice uh, type people like the first two speakers, they supported mm -hmm. and I think would be great. But they're actually in the Bay Area, so you could do that one on one before you do a big review. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you, Carl, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, so minerals exist in oligoplastic markets, and, and those are difficult markets. Um, it, it's difficult to really incentivize competition within these markets relative to, say, agricultural markets, um, and therefore many barriers to scale up. In your work, what have you found to be those major issues in these types of oligoplastic? oligoplastic settings, um, and how does modern policy, industrial policy need to adapt to it, ensure relevant incentives so that we see and we get hmm. together again? Yeah, the oligopoly question is an interesting one. I'm not sure I 100% agree that minerals markets are oligopolistic. They, they, they tend to be a lot of, they're obviously the big mining companies, Anglo, American, BHP, uh, Rio Tinto, and they have a lot of market power. Um, but Kind of, if you look at sort of how minerals markets work, they they tend to operate pretty uh, like like if you look at economic models of how they do price clearing and stuff, they tend to operate based on like supply demand balance. Does that make sense? So maybe there's a sort of a small caveat there, but I think to kind of take your point a little further. Uh, there are non-economic considerations that you sh that these models should be accounting for. So the Indonesia example, they're not necessarily operating based on making the most profit on their mining project. They are trying to set up a mining industry to support a battery industry. So they're willing to take a loss on the mining to support a downstream industry, right? So it's not your convention. The mining system is not just doing the supply demand balance that I do in these models. And potentially we need to account for the non-economic behavior, I guess, non-conventional demand supply economic behavior in those models, which is not accounted for right now. Thank you. Yeah. So you introduced, uh, or you talked about carbon tax as one thing that could be, um, for example, like stop the, uh, the physical uh, yeah. process. But what are some other strategies uh, that maybe get at the core of perhaps like innovating the processes so they're not as dirty. Are yeah. there? Oh, yeah, hundred percent. So one thing I'll kind of, I spoke about carbon tax. Typically when you talk about mineral extraction, you're more worried about land and water. Carbon, the amount of carbon you save from making a battery is much greater than the carbon emitted from mining and processing typically. Um, so you're often worried about non-carbon impacts. So that's just a caveat to add to that. So there's a lot of technologies that Try to reduce carbon, but also try to reduce water resource impacts and things like that. And um, the kind of question is sort of if you look at that supply curve, uh, if you have sort of technology innovation, can you sort of reduce the height of that? So some of those projects, if you can, if you can tag this as let's say, let's go to the other one. You have some sort of dirtier ones and cleaner ones, and the cleaner ones have you have some innovation that can reduce the environmental impact, make it go from red to blue. That might currently be higher cost. Trying to think about when will that cost technology learning happen and that cost go down for you to eventually have low impact processes. So in the lithium case, you have like direct lithium extraction, which is a little like early stage, which is supposed to have lower water resource impacts. But the question is sort of what is, how much more costly is that compared to conventional brine pond and can you compete? So you can use this framework to model the impact of innovation. So you can say, if I reduce cost by this much for these projects, where does that put you on the supply curve? And will will that make that project open faster or not? So does that answer your question? I feel like it's not answering your question. Um, it does kind of answer the question, but I'm wondering about like specific strategies currently hmm. the, the field is like talking about. So I mean, yeah. so you said like, a carbon tax is maybe not the most appropriate. So are there, is there a water tax? Is there like, mm. you know, what other incentives are there? Yeah. I think the main incentives that are sort of starting but are not there, you need a lot of like demonstration projects. Like you need people for these new technologies. You need someone to take the risk of the cost of someone going and trying that out in a mineral plant and seeing if that works at low cost. 
and sort of that's where industrial policy without like taxes and subsidies you can go in and support a lot of demonstration projects for new technologies and can then that can help sort of scale up because mining and refining tends to be very risk averse that they, they don't want to try out new technologies all that often so to the point at which governments can step in and help like do demonstration kind of support that or like sort of early to mid trl stage projects that is useful um the eu has this thing like the battery passport which kind of does sort of tracking along the supply chain the final thing i'll say is supply chain transparency um kind of going back to that project with ford it was surprising to me, surprising to me that ford did not know where all of its materials came from in the sense that the the way the data set works necessarily like in the sense that the way the data set works is they have suppliers who have suppliers who have suppliers who have suppliers right so kind of tracking that supply chain they are not very easily able to tell whether their material is coming from that indonesian source or whether it's coming from the canadian source right um and so you're having more things like off take agreements and stuff where you kind of directly tie yourself with a particular producer but you need somewhat more supply chain transparency that i can go and compare like if i'm a consumer and tesla makes a you know a completely sustainable metals version of their car which is $1000 more expensive you can actually track that and say that i am buying a car that is better than the other car and i'm willing to pay a price premium and that transparency doesn't exist so that's another way for governments and stuff can come in um yeah but, oh sorry Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, so my question is from a developing country perspective so you explain how carbon tax can reduce the price of say nickel and then it can reduce the product and reducing the welfare overall welfare of the people of the citizens yeah. other you recommended the government to have an industrial policy to support technologies and new projects and new technologies and so on and promote recycling and so on. but yeah. in that case as well there is a transfer of resources from say welfare oriented activities to these projects especially on the critical minerals and other materials mm. so uh, so will not that lead eat into the fiscal space of a government or yeah it's true that so i i think i want to be careful here i'm not trying to say that we shouldn't build projects in indonesia what i'm trying to say is that the kind of supply chain pressure we are putting on these material supply chain Are, are forcing developing countries to act in ways where they have to make these trade-offs between producing as, as low cost as possible and sort of social impact right so the, so these you you could set up more sustainable extraction processes in developing countries but the value of the material should sort of be appropriately passed on to those countries does that make sense so it, i think right yeah So, uh, so I wanted to ask uh, whether the developing countries can afford such industrial policies from that perspective. I get your point that we are not saying that Indonesia Indonesia should close those mines and so on, but can uh, developing countries afford those industrial policies? Or, for instance, the US may have much larger fiscal space to do that, which yeah. may not be the case in India. So, I, I exactly. I think uh, the developing countries can't afford those necessarily those fiscal policies, which is why. there needs to be this supply chain support if i am a consumer in the us and i care about the supply chain and these impacts i need to be able to incentivize that in developing countries right through a basically through a price premium for cleaner material um so even if i can't afford to do that in a developing country to make that trade off myself the market should be structured in a way that promotes the developing country to act in that way the way you want and currently it's not structured in that way right so we're almost squeezing developing countries rather than allowing them to decarbonize which is sort of the problem right so even if they can't do it themselves you need sort of that demand side support to help that happen make that happen one more question who's got a good one two i'll give you oh. two Could you give us a sense um the exchange of these materials is how much of it is happening through commodity markets and how much is long term contracts where you kind of tie yourself for longer term or maybe even supply chain vertical integration where you're just same company yeah 
um, a lot of offtakes and long-term agreements, especially for people who have market power, um, like you know the Teslas of the world. You have like many. They they want to de-risk the supply chain, right? So they want to make sure that they know where the material is coming from next five to ten years. So you do have a lot of offtake agreements with various producers. Um, but those agreements tend to be uh, linked to commodity markets. So the price that they pay for those materials, if the commodity markets are low, they will want to pay lower. Um, so it there, there isn't a premium that people are paying in these contracts right now, or at least I don't think there is. Um, and uh, you know they continue to put price pressure on the supply chain. So, and from their perspective, they are competing with ICEs, right? If I am Tesla or Ford or I make an EV, I am trying to make the cheapest car possible because I'm competing against ICEs. So sort of there's this pressure that you keep putting on a supply chain. And even though they're long-term contracts, those contracts aren't tied to um, sort of these sort of environmental attributes and there's no price premiums in those contracts necessarily. I'll, I'll you can get the last yeah. question over on that side, yes. Yeah, have you and your team modeled uranium specifically? Um, and then also, what type of assumptions do we use to imprint uh, when compared to other clean We have not. I have not looked at uranium myself. Um, ah. Why should I? Why should I? Uh, because there's a bunch of assumptions that are specific, in my opinion, to the nuclear industry in the United States specifically, mm -hmm. and a bunch of opinions on where where we should be sourcing, how expensive it is, and then impacts of the economics of the waste processing as well. Cool. Well, that's interesting. And then that's sort of, you have this choice between nuclear and batteries, and you can kind of look at those trade-offs. Yeah, that would be cool to do. You want to do it? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's no shortage of interesting problems to look at, right? Um, but yeah, I haven't gotten to uranium yet, but now it's on the radar, so thanks for that. Okay, so we're uh, sadly out of time for this stage. You can catch the run after, or we're lucky enough to be one of the Thanks, everyone.